So, uh, welcome everybody. The next talk is by Professor Mohammad Ilham Dadi from University of South Florida. And Professor Ilham Dadi is an expert in algebraic and geometric topology, including knot theory, uh, protein folding, quantum invariance of knots. He also has interest in K theory. And he's going to talk about uh, algebraic theory of uh, quandals. He is also author of the first book on quandals. So, he is the right person to talk on this subject. So, Professor Alam Dadi, over to you. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending where you are. And uh, basically, I will talk about uh, generalities about quandals. I'll start with a little review of knot theory. And then I will explain the motivation for quandals. Then I will discuss some invariant, uh, couple invariants of knots coming from quandals. And depending on the time, if I have time, I may talk a little bit about uh, topological quandal today. If not, I will do that tomorrow. And uh, I will talk also tomorrow about uh, some recent work of Dr. Bardako, Passi, and uh, uh, Singmander in uh, quandal rings, basically. Okay, then let me start with some basics. Uh, we start with the definition of knot. A knot is just the image of smooth embedding of the circle in R3. Now, I have a piece of rope. Basically, this is a knot. I just take like interval. I put a knot in it, and then I glue the end. And then one has to see it in the three space, lying in R3 or in the three sphere, if you consider the compactification of R3. Then this is a knot laying in the three space. Okay. Uh, now we consider two knots to be equivalent if one can be deformed to obtain the other one. The requirement of the deformation is at, at no time the knot should go through itself. Then two knots are called isotopic. That's the technical word for it. Two knots K and K prime are isotopic if K prime can be obtained by continuous deformation with no self intersection. Now, if you do self intersection, then you get out of classical knot theory. You can do what's called singular knot theory, uh, Vasilev uh, uh, theory of knots. That's uh, something else we will not talk about today. Now, technically speaking, we say that two knots are equivalent if there is a smooth family of homeomorphism parameterized by the time, zero, one, such that at time zero, initially you have your knot K and you have your knot K prime. And then you, at time one, you end up K become K prime. Then we say that K and K prime are equivalent. One way of studying knots is combinatorial. And basically what we do, we take a knot, then again, I go back to this knot in the three space, and I project it on R2 in such a way that I, that I get a diagram. Again, one has to be careful about how you project so you don't get some singularities. And uh, when you have diagrams, uh, we have a big theorem of uh, Raidmeister which tell us that knot theory in the three space can be reduced to knot diagrams in the plane modulo Raidmeister uh, mode. Okay, then I already mentioned uh, what is not diagram. Now, when we do the, the projection, we obtain uh, what's called overcrossing and undercrossing. Okay, if I go back to the to this picture, the trefoil, this is the uh, one diagram of the trefoil, we see overcrossings and undercrossing. Start from certain points on the knot and uh, go around, and you're gonna have overcrossing and undercrossing. Uh, when we study a knot, we use basically invariant of knot. Uh, what is an invariant of knot is it's certain function from the set of knots to a fixed set. And we want this function to give us the same result whenever the two knots are equivalent. For every two equivalent knots, you should end up with the same invariant. Uh, this means that if I have two knots and I construct certain invariants, if I can prove 
or if I can check that the two invariants are different, that guarantees that the knots cannot be equivalent. And this is used often in knot theory from combinatorial points of view. Now, this is the Raidmeister theorem. As I mentioned, Raidmeister told us that to study knots in the three space, the knots in three space modulo isotopy is the same thing as knot diagrams in R2, modulo uh, Raidmeister move one, Raidmeister move two, and Raidmeister move three, and continuous deformation in R2. We call it also isotopy. Now, here are the, the diagrammatic of red master moves. The first one is R1. Then you have your knot, but locally, locally in some small disk, you have this shape. And basically what you do, you just deform it to become straight, okay? And outside this disk, you have the, the, the rest of the knot. For example, if, uh, if we go back to the first three, three foil, I can focus here at this part of the arc and I can add some kink here and that will not change the, the knot. A red master move two is the one on the right. Basically you have two strings. You can see that on the right, one goes completely over on both, both crossings. As both crossings, it's over, over, over arc, over arc. Now again, since knots are in the three space, Basically, you have the, the height function. You can lift it and pull them apart so you can get this one. This also can be seen in terms of uh, braids that you have some uh, sigma i multiplied by sigma i inverse, you know. Positive crossing, negative crossing, they cancel each other. And uh, red master move three, which is this one. Again, locally in certain small ball, small disc. You take the picture on the left and you modify it to get the picture on the right. And again, they seem to be a little bit intuitive. If you look at this string here, this string here you have over, both crossing. This is over crossing, over crossing. It's an over crossing followed by an over crossing. As I mentioned, you can lift this, you are in the three space. And if you push this up, you obtain the other picture on the right. Then this is red master move three. Again, red master move one, red master move two, and red master move three. Then anytime you want to construct an invariant of knot, you have to guarantee that your construction does not change by this move, R1, R2, and R3. When you do so, you have an invariant of knot and you can start computing. Okay, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Quandl, just, just a brief history. Obviously, uh, they appeared even before 1940, but we will not go that far. Uh, around 1940, uh, the Japanese mathematician Mitsuhisa Takasaki introduced the notion of K. In the modern language, we will call it involutive Quandl. It's Quandl with the binary operation in such a way that right multiplication is an involution. Basically, right multiplication, uh, its inverse is the same, which means basically you're studying uh, unoriented knots. Positive, there's no positive negative process. Now, his paper was called Abstraction of Symmetric Transformation, Introduction to the Theory of, of P. Uh, around the 80s, there used to be two, uh, two famous mathematicians, uh, David Joyce and Sergei Matvev, independently uh, introduced the notion of quantum. Now, Joss called this quandle, Matvev called this distributive group with in knot theory. And you can find the papers uh, on, on the internet. Around 88, Brias Korn introduced what he called automorphic, automorphic sets and singularities. Very nice paper. Uh, Lou Kaufman uh, also discussed uh, quandles around 1990s and he called them crystals. Uh, Later, around 1992, uh, the um, Fenn, Rourke, and Sanderson uh, discussed racks and quandles. And uh, around 1999, uh, some of my co-authors, Carter, uh, 
Scott Carter, Masahiko Saito, in collaboration with Seichi Kamada and uh, a few other students. I think uh, Jesowski, Daniel Jesowski and uh, Langford, they wrote a nice paper around 1999 in the transaction of the AMS and they discuss what's called Quandel co-cycle invariant. We will talk about it today. Okay, uh, let me start then by the definition. Before I talk about Quandel, I'm going to talk about rack. Rack is just a set with a binary operation, we denote it by a triangle. You just start with the set, any set, it can be finite, infinite, uh, topological, whatever you want. Obviously, you have to be careful when, depending which category you are in. But right now, we'll be just in the category of sets. Then maps are just uh, set theoretical maps. Uh, isomorphism will be bijections, etc. Okay, then you have a binary operation, and you require that right multiplication by every element is a bijection. Uh, the second uh, relation is that uh, it is right distributive. The operation distributes on itself from the right. Now, I will explain in the next slide where do this, uh, these equations come, come, come from. Now, the first two axioms, right, uh, right invertibility or invertibility of right multiplication and the distributivity, uh, are used when you are dealing with the knot theory without requiring uh, Redmaster move one. Basically, uh, you're doing framed knot theory. Okay. Uh, and then there is the no, uh, in that space you're talking about a rack. You do not require uh, uh, idempotency potency for the, for the binary operation. Okay, now let's see where do these axioms come from. They come from basically this. You have your knot diagram, you pick a cross in, and you do the following. You assign variables to the, to the arcs. Again, we will be dealing with what we call tamed knot. I will not have infinitely many crossing. That's not allowed. That's wild knot. That's different story. And the rule is this. Uh, if you look at the diagram on the left, it is what we call a positive crossing. Positive crossing means if I put my thumb on the over arc, uh, my, this finger points in the same direction as the other one. That's positive crossing. And the mirror image, if you just imagine you have a mirror in between, the mirror image will give you the other one. Then the under arc, the incoming under arc is X, the outgoing is X triangle Y. Uh, notice that we did not change the color of the over arc. Now, obviously we can do that. We can do something slightly more general in which we can uh, put the incoming arcs being X and Y, and we can put two general functions in the outcoming, say F of X, Y and G of X, Y. And again, you go through uh, Redmaster moves and you get something slightly more general called biquandals. We will not talk about them today, but you can find that uh, on the archives. Biquandals were used a lot in the theory of virtual, virtual knot theory, which was invented by Luke Hoffman. Okay, and look at this. The reason we put this, that if you put this diagram, this uh, two diagrams, one on the top of each other, you, you get exactly red master move two. And the red master move two allow you to pull them apart. Then we start with red master move one on the left. We color the arc by X. The outcoming is X triangle X. And since you want this to be the same, then you require X triangle X to be X. The diagram on the right is the red master move two. Then again, you start with the incoming arc, you color them X, Y. The first crossing is positive. You end up with X triangle Y. The next one is negative. And then you end up with X triangle Y triangle inverse Y. And obviously that has to be X. Basically, this is just right multiplication by Y composed by its inverse, which they cancel each other. Okay, then the next one is uh, red master move three. And the Redmaster move three explains the, the right distributivity of the binary operation. We have picture of Redmaster move three. We color the incoming arcs by respectively from left to right X, Y, Z. We go through each cross in, 
we use the rule of, of coloring. And then we look at the outgoing arts at the bottom. Then it's clear that uh, you get the, uh, the coloring on, on at the bottom. And the most left is Z, Z, same, Y triangle Z. And the third one to the right is X triangle Y, parenthesis triangle Z equal basically the right distributed. Now this is the motivation where the, the, the axioms of, of Quandel come from. And we will see later that uh, Quandel, uh, uh, Sergei Matvev and David Joyce, they have big theorems saying that some knots are equivalent if and only if some quandals are equivalent, uh, are isomorphic. Okay, we will get there in, in a little bit. Now, obviously, since we gave the definition, we have to give some, uh, some examples. Now, start with a group, let G be a group, and consider conjugation on it. Conjugation on it gives a quandal operation. One can check the three axiom easily. Notice that if the group is abelian, this operation becomes x triangle y equal x. And the quandals on which uh, for any x y, x triangle y equal x are called the trivial quandals. They are not that interesting because they don't give any, much, any good invariant of mass. Uh, the next quandal is start with the group again and consider the operation x triangle y equal y x inverse y. This is called the core group. One can see that this right multiplication by y is an involution. If you do x triangle y, parenthesis triangle y, you'll end up with x. Again, this is involutive quandel, and uh, Takasaki called them k in, in, in Japanese. Another quandel is if you take the integers mod n, and you define x triangle y by 2y minus x mod n. This is usually called the dihedral quandle and denoted by R sub n. The reason of the name dihedral because it's related to the dihedral group D sub two, uh, dn, which is the group of order 2n given by generator and relation. You have the rotation, you have a regular n gone, you have the rotation 2 pi over n as generator, and you have the reflection with the, the generators and relation. If you take the if you take the set of reflections and you do conjugation on it, you use conjugation, you can reduce it to basically this, x triangle y equal to y minus x. Basically, every element uh, in, in the dihedral group can be, uh, first you start with the generators, say uh, x and y, such that xn equal one, y squared equal one, and y x, y equal x inverse. And then every element can be written as xi times y. Okay. Uh, in fact, you can replace you can replace the zn by any group, any abelian group. This is called the Takasaki quandel. X triangle y equal to y minus x in an abelian group. The next example we have is what's called the Alexander quandel. Take a Lorentz polynomial uh, module over Lorentz polynomial, z of tt inverse module, and define x triangle y as tx plus 1 minus ty. One can check that this is quandle. The algebra is, they call it a fine quandle because you can think of it as uh, x triangle y is alpha x plus beta y. Uh, if you require just rack, you don't have to have alpha plus beta equal 1. But if you require quandle, obviously alpha plus beta equal one, that's why you have Tx and one minus T1. Now we get to the, what's called the knot quandle or the fundamental quandle of a knot. And this is the reason of the whole theory. Basically you start with a knot diagram. Okay, you label the arcs by some variables. And the rule is at each crossing, you write the relation, depending if it's positive crossing or negative crossing. But assuming I have positive crossing with the incoming arc colored X, the over arc colored, colored Y, the outgoing arc, the, uh, under, uh, the outgoing under arc will be colored by Z, then I get the relation X triangle Y equals Z. The quantum generated by the labels, the variables, modulo the relation is called the knot quandle and usually denoted by Q of K. 
they call it also the fundamental quandle of the knot. Let's look at an example. Now here I, uh, I draw the, the left-handed trefoil. If you look at each crossing, it's negative crossing. If I put my, uh, my uh, thumb on the over crossing, this, this finger point the opposite direction to the arc, I get three negative crossings. Then I have three variables, X, Y, Z, which color the three arcs. And the relations, I write the relation at each, uh, each, each crossing. I get X triangle inverse Y equals Z, Y triangle inverse Z equals X, and Z triangle inverse X equals Y. Now, obviously, this can be simplified with little algebra to just uh, the fundamental quantile of the left-handed trefoil given by two generator X, Y, and these relations, these two relations. You see that I got rid of the inverse relation, like the first one, X triangle inverse Y, Z, I just write it as Z triangle Y equal X. Instead of using the inverse operation, I use the, uh, the operation. And this is the fundamental quantile of the left-handed trefoil. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, quandle homomorphism. As you expect, you have two quandles, X with a certain binary operation named triangle, Y with the operation named star, and the homomorphism is just intuitive. If it's bijective, you get isomorphism. And this is the notion of quandle isomorphism. And uh, we will need this uh, to state the theorem of uh, Joyce and Madbeck. Now, the theorem states that Two knots K and L are equivalent, to be precise, uh, they are called weakly equivalent, if and only if the fundamental quandle of K and the fundamental quandle of L are isomorphic as quandles. Then basically what they are doing, they are taking a topology problem, equivalence of, uh, of knots, and they are moving the problem to algebra, isomorphism of, of quandles. And this is basically what uh, Poincaré did back in 1900. He's taking topology problems and turn them into algebra problems. You have the homotopy groups, uh, homology, cohomology, etc. Uh, okay, to be precise, what I mean by weakly equivalent means that R3, then you consider the pair, the, the not K sitting in R3, the not L sitting in R3, and you look at them as, as uh, topo uh, topological pairs and you ignore the orientation of R3 and the knot, okay? Uh, to be a little bit precise, take a knot and consider the mirror image of it, will denote it by MK. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to get rid of this blue thing. Uh, oops. Maybe it's some image, try to move it using the cursor. I don't know what I did, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't know how to get rid of it. It's okay. Uh, but if it doesn't bother the audience, I guess I'll just continue. I don't need to waste time. Fine. Sorry. Uh, then take, take a knot, do its mirror image, uh, take a knot and do what's called the reverse orientation. The same knot, but you reverse the orientation. And now I can restate the theorem of Joyce and Matveev. The theorem of Joyce and Matveev will say that two knots, uh, uh, K, Precisely that K and L are equivalent if and only if QK equal QL or the Q of K is the same thing as Q of the reverse mirror image of L. Now, uh, notice that the fundamental quantum does not distinguish between, for example, the right-handed trefoil and the left-handed trefoil. Now, for students, they should do that as little exercise. Uh, earlier, I did, uh, I did the left-handed trefoil. Go ahead and do its mirror image. Draw the right-handed trefoil. Color the ax by some variables, say U, V, W. Write the fundamental quantile, simplify it, and uh, double-check that you get the same presentation, basically. Then it is, uh, it is not possible to distinguish left-handed trefoil from right-handed trefoil using the fundamental quantile of the knot. Okay, this is something I already said, that Joyce and Matveev changed the problem of equivalence of not into isomorphism of quantum. Okay, then obviously people start looking at uh, not at quantums up to isomorphism. Uh, this is just a little bit of random classification. Uh, before this, before uh, 2012, 
Sam Nelson did some classification. Other people did some classification. I think some students of uh, uh, Dr. Saito did also some computer classification. But the point is just let me decide the, the, the number of isomorphism classes of quantum. Okay. Quantum of order one is boring, not much. Quantum of two elements is also boring, it's trivial quantum. Uh, things get interesting starting from three. Okay. Uh, three elements quantum, there are three different uh, classes. For four, you have seven classes, 522, etc. You see, as you increase the number, the cardinality of the quantum, and the number and on the left is the cardinality of the quantum, the, on the right, you have the number of quantums up to isomorphism. Now, this was done by uh, my students, Jennifer McQuarrie, she did the master thesis with me back in 2011, and uh, Ricardo Restrepo, he, he was the one uh, doing the, the programming. Uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, getting nine required a lot of work. He had to use some uh, supercomputers at USF. And the best he could do back then is getting a uh, number of isomorphism quantums up to order nine. Uh, recently, just last year, uh, Peter Wojtykowski and his postdoc Sunyop Young, uh, Sunyop, I think, now is in uh, South Korea. He was his postdoc, and they wrote a nice paper titled Enumeration of Racks and Quantum Up to Isomorphism. You can find it on, on archive or on the MathSciNet. It's published by the American Mathematical Journal Math Computations, and they pushed things to up to 13. Then in addition to the previous numbers we had, now we have the number of quantum for order 10, 11, 12, and 13. You see the number gets really huge. Now here we are doing classification of all quantum. Separately, in Argentina, uh, Van der Amin did classification of what's called connected quantum uh, using this rig, Rax in, uh, in GAP, I think, and he was able to get really higher, I think, up to order 45, if I'm not mistaken. We will uh, give the definition of connected quantum in a moment. Now, here, this is classification of all quantum. Obviously, it gets complicated. Now, let's talk about some group attached to a quantum. Whenever you have a quantum, you can take the, the set of all automorphisms of X. This is a group, the group of automorphisms, out of X. Inside this group, you have uh, some nice subgroup. It's called the inner automorphism group, which is the group generated by right multiplication by little x, where x belongs to x. Now, if you go back to a right distributivity equation, okay, uh, here I will write it as A triangle B triangle C equal A triangle C triangle B triangle C. And I can change it to look like this with little algebra. You make it to look like this. Now, this equation tells me that the map sending X to R, R sub X is a quantum homomorphism. Because it's, if you do R of B triangle C, it becomes R of B triangle uh, R of C. But the second triangle is in the inner group, which is conjugation. Now, if this map is injective, they talk about faithful quantum, etc. There is ni another nice group in within the inner group. It's called the transvection group. It's the group generated by R sub X, R sub Y inverse. No one can check uh, quickly that inner group is normal subgroup of automorphism group. And also the transvection group uh, is a normal subgroup of the inner group. And obviously, one can take the quotients. Now, if you take the quotients of inner group by transvection, basically, you'll be forcing Rx to be Ry, then you get cyclic group. Uh, and Joyce call it the transvection group. Here are some uh, few computations. Take the integers mod n with the binary operation 2y minus x. So here I am writing star instead of triangle. And the automorphism group is nothing but a fine group of Zn. Basically, uh, it's given by pairs AB in Zn. And this is the affine functions Ax plus B. Uh, because you want its automorphism, A has to be invertible in Zn. And the inner group is just the dihedral group dm over 2, where m is the least common multiple of 2 and n. Uh, this was in the thesis of Jennifer. Uh, recently, uh, Bardakov, Nasibirov, and Singh in 2017 computed the automorphism of group 
of quandals in, in the context of conjugation, and they prove that automorphism of the quandal is equal automorphism of the group if the center of the group is trivial. Now one can see quickly that inner is just the group modulo its center. That's not difficult. There is another interesting group related uh, or coming from quandals, which is called the associated group of the quandal. Uh, it is also called in, in the literature uh, enveloping group. Basically, the idea is you want you start with the quandal and you want to turn that operation in in the quandal into conjugation. Basically, conjugations are are the main the main uh, example of quandals. Then what do you do? You start with your quandal. You take the free group f of x, the free group on on the on the, on the quandal x, and you mod by the normal subgroup generated by the relation x triangle y, y x inverse y inverse. In the quotient, you're going to have x triangle y will become exactly conjugation, y x y inverse. Uh, this is a big group, obviously, because you're involving the, pen, the free group. But this group has a nice uh, universal property, which is the following. If you pick any group, you consider conjugation quandal on it. Start with the quandal homomorphism from X to Y, you get this commutative diagram. Then vertically from X to con conjug G conjugation, which is just G with the quandal uh, conjugation on it. Now, obviously, from construction, you know that X embeds in the associated group of X. And what this, does this tell you? That there exists a unique group homomorphism from associated group of X to G in such a way that this diagram commutes. In other words, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, group homomorphism from the associated uh, group of uh, associated group of the quantal X into G with the homomorphism of quandal from x to conjugation. Now, these are two quandals, these are two groups. This is homomorphism in the category of group, this is homomorphism in the category of quandals. Uh, here is a nice simple example, the dihedral quandal R3, uh, integers mod 3 with this binary operation. One can compute the associated quandal of it. It's given by x, y with the following relation. x, y, x, y, x, y, x squared equal y squared. If you focus on this one, some may recognize that this is uh, the braid group on three strings, B3. B3 is given by two generator x, y, such that x, y, x equal y, x, y. Now, since you have an extra relation here, this is a quotient. Uh, I think Van der Amin uh, proved that for connected quandals. Okay, let me say what is connected quandal. A connected quandal, I think uh, the definition may be coming. Yes, this is the definition of connected quandal. You have the inner group acting on the quandal. If the, qua if the action is transitive, meaning you have only one orbit, the quandal is, uh, the quandal is called connected quandal. Then if you have a connected quandal, the associated group of the quandal is a semi-direct product of uh, its commutator with uh, integers. Uh, Bardakov, Nasibirov, and Singh in 2017 proved that the associated uh, quandal of the dihedral quandal R3 is the Z3 semi-direct product with integers. Now, to give you a simple example of quandals that are connected and some that are not connected, just take a look at uh, integers modulo L. And you look at two cases. If L is an odd number, they come, to, they come out to be connected. That's easy uh, elementary computation. If it's even, Z to N, you end up with the two orbits. Basically, the even numbers go in one orbit, the odd numbers go in the other orbit. Uh, the, the interest in connected quandal, that's connected quandal color than not. If you have one component, we call it, one can talk about links when you have many components. And if you have one knot, meaning one component, and if you have a knot, uh, a quandal that's color that knot, the quandal will, will be connected quandal. Remember that as you go through the crossing, you're doing a right multiplication by some element. Now we can state that connected quandal also is that if you pick any two elements, X and Y, you can go from X to Y by some right multiplication or right multiplication inverse.
Uh, okay, let me talk, uh, give a few class of quantums. I have to move on because time is uh, moving quicker. We can, the, there is a notion of medial quantum, um, which is a quantum that satisfies this relation for any four elements x, y, and z. Now, the word medial is explained by just taking a look at this. You see that the two medial terms, y and z, are, are switched. Now, uh, Joyce called them abelian quantum. The word abelian may be misleading, but there is a reason why he called them abelian quantum because you can check that this relation is equivalent to the transvection group being abelian. Then the transvection group, the group generated by uh, Rx, Ry inverse, that group is uh, abelian if and only if you have this relation. There is a notion of Latin quantum. It's quantum in which left multiplication are invertible. Usually when we have quantum, we only require that right multiplication is invertible. But if, in, in addition, left multiplications are invertible, you get what's called Latin quantum. And then the Cayley table will be just Latin square. Uh, recently, uh, Bardakov, uh, Passy, and Singh introduced the notion of semi-Latin quantum. It's in their last paper on the archive. I will talk about that tomorrow when I start talking about quantum rings, some of their work on quantum rings. And, uh, a quantum is semi-Latin if its left multiplication are injective. Instead of bijective, you just require injective. Obviously, one will ask uh, an example. Uh, here, here, is, here are two examples. An example of semi-Latin that is not Latin, which means that the notion of semi-Latin has meaning. Uh, if you take core of Z, remember, Z, Z is an abelian group. And then earlier we wrote core G as uh, X triangle Y being Y X inverse Y. If you write it in additive notation, it's just Y minus X. This is the Takasaki quantum. And it's straightforward to see that it's not Latin. Uh, if you have an abelian group, the core of it is semi-Latin if and only if the group has no two torsion. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about uh, precise definition of coloring of knots, even though I mentioned it earlier when I did those uh, axioms of, of quantum coming from the pictures of the knot and the Redmaster moves. Uh, coloring of a knot is uh, by a certain quantum X, is precisely a quantum homomorphism between the fundamental quantum of the knot mapping it to X. Now, uh, 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 Joseph Brzezinski will talk about uh, most likely uh, some coloring of, of knots. And this is a theorem taken from one of his papers back in 1998, that the number of coloring denoted by color sub X of K, then I take a knot, I see how many possible coloring I have by given a, a quantum X, and that is an invariant of knot, meaning it does not change by red master move one, red master move two, red master move three. Uh, one way of doing coloring of knots uh, from computer is that you can use the braid, the, the braid form of the knot. There is theorem which says, I think it's Alexander theorem saying that every knot it corresponds to the closure of braid. And uh, if you go to knot info, uh, Chuck Livingston website at the University of Indiana, you can get the braid form of the knot there. And when you start with the braid, you put a vector, the colors on the top, and you push everything to the bottom. And since you want to close the knot, you, you solve basically the equation. You want fixed points for that that's a map if you want. The other people use maybe Gauss diagrams, etc. I mean, there are different uh, ways of computing the coloring of, of, of the knots. Okay. Uh, Maybe I should have said one word that uh, with this one can prove that the threefold cannot be unknotted. If you take the unknot and you color it by three colors, the tricolorability, you have only three possible colors. If I'm using Z3 as 0, 1, 2, then I have three, three possible colors, either 0, 1, or 2. If you take the threefold, you can prove that <clears throat> if you put uh, two, uh, two variables at two arc, it determines the third one automatically. And then you end up with nine possible arcs, uh, nine possible coloring, I'm sorry, nine possible coloring. The number of coloring of the threefold is nine. The number of coloring of the unknot is three. 
that that gives an elementary proof that the threefold cannot be the same as the unknown. Okay, uh, we want to talk a little bit about homology of quandals, but uh, I prefer to start from down and going up. Basically, talk about two co-cycle, three co-cycle, and then come up to the chain complex and explain uh, or give the formula. Now, uh, take take a cross in like this. You have a knot diagram and you have cross in and you put some Boltzmann weights at each crossing like this. Now here, phi is function which goes from x cross x, and the output is in certain abelian group. I will call it A. And the rule is this, at positive crossing, I have this weight, they call it Boltzmann weight. At negative crossing, I have this one. And obviously you can see why I have a minus and plus. The point is that if I stack them on top of each other, that should be red master move two, Red master move to you have no contribution, zero contribution, then they have to adapt to zero. Uh, then here is the precise definition of two core cycle. Then I have a function phi from x cross x into an abelian group A. It has to satisfy this relation. Now, again, to see this equation is not difficult. You just go to, <coughs> sorry, you go to a red master move three. This is the coloring we did earlier. And you put the three weights on the left, the three weights on the right, you add them and you equal them, and you get exactly the equation we had. Notice that because we have an abelian group, we can have on the left phi of yz, and on the right we can have phi of yz, and that disappears. You can cancel it from each side. Because I'm using an abelian group, if I do things with non-abelian group, they remain and you have to be careful. Then again, if you ignore these two crossing, you're going to have phi of xy, plus phi of x triangle y z equal phi of x z phi of x z y z which is exactly the two co cycle condition here now if we want the three co cycle we can talk about i have to really move a little bit quicker uh, we can do what's called the shadow coloring or the coloring of the regions then first you color the arc by the variables x y x angle y and you color the regions the reason is that this will be a region. This is another region, etc. And the rule is this: when I go from this region to this one, the C becomes C triangle X, and this basically tells you that this region coloring is well defined because of the right distributivity. Now, here, what we're gonna do? We can play somehow similar uh, game at at this crossing with the the coloring of the region and the X. We'll assign a function of three variables. C, X, Y, okay, some kind of Boltzmann weight. For the same reason, we put minus here. And again, if I go back to a red master move three, I add the regions, I go through the arc, I color all the regions, and I apply the rule, I get exactly my three co cycle condition, which, which, which can be written in this form, okay. Now, if you put everything on one side in this equation by turning the right-hand side to the left and seeking the minuses, you do the same thing with the other one. You can see that there is certain pattern. And here we're going to talk about uh, quandal homology. In fact, uh, historically it's appeared as rack homology by Van Roort and Sanderson in early 1990s. And uh, later... Uh, Carter say to Kamada and uh, the students, they generalized it for quandals. Then basically I take the Cartesian product of, of uh, x n times, x n, and take the free abelian group on these tuples, and you can define a boundary this way. The formula is this, delta n of x1 up to x n. The first piece looks like singular homology. Students remember you remove the x i. The second piece, the second term, uh, obviously all this comes from some diagrammatic, which I'm not showing here, but anything to the left of i, meaning x1 up to xi minus 1, xi minus 1 gets multiplied by xi from the right. The one on the right of xi remain as, as they are. One can prove that if you compose delta n with delta n plus 1, you get 0, then you have a chain complex, and you get the rack homology. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Carter, Seitu, Kamada, and Jelsovsky and Lamford, they realized that if you take the degeneracy subcomplex, 
which is uh, generated by tuples such that two consecutive elements are equal, you can check that the, the boundary maps the, uh, the degenerated n into n minus one. This allows you to do a little bit of homological algebra. You can take the, the quotient complex and you get the homology theory or the cohomology theory. Here are some early computations. Uh, these computations are taken from the paper of Carter's, uh, Carter, Jesowski, Kamada, Langford, Seto, back in 1999, I think. This is paper which appeared in the transaction in 2000. Okay, you have the third, uh, third homology of the dihedral quantum with coefficient in Z3 is Z3. We'll come back to it later. It's going to appear in uh, Mochizoki, Kosaikel, and uh, Yosef uh, Krzyzewski with his students. Uh, this some generalization of that. H2 are computed this way. These are just the dihedral quantum. They are nice quantum. This is three elements dihedral quantum. This is four elements dihedral quantum. This is five element dihedral quantum. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, back in 2003, Mochi Mochizuki gave really nice uh, <coughs> formula for the generator here, the H3, the quantum H3 of the dihedral quantum RP, P is prime, then this is ZP with uh, operation 2Y minus X. The cohomology with coefficient in ZP is one dimensional, and he gave explicit formula for the generating three cosine. This is the explicit formula for it. Notice that this piece here is divisible by P, then this quotient makes sense. This appeared in paper by uh, Mochizoki. Maciek, uh, Niebridowski, and Josef Krzyzewski proved uh, in 2008 if you pick uh, prime add, they looked at the fourth. Uh, homology group of the RP. They proved it contains ZP and they gave a conjecture that it's uh, the delayed Fibonacci sequence that HN is given by this formula. Obviously, F3 is one. You recover the Mochizoki uh, case. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on. Now, earlier we spoke about the coloring invariants. The set of coloring, or the cardinality of that set, which is the number of coloring, is uh, an invariant of maps. Now, this, is, this will be an enhancement. This was done by uh, Carter, Jesowski, Kamada, Langford, and Seitu. It's called the quandel cocycle invariant. Uh, the idea is that you have two quandels, you compute the coloring, and you end up with the same number. You cannot tell them apart. You have to do something better to, to be able to tell them apart. Basically, you do this quantal cocycle invariant, some kind of partition of that set of coloring. Then start with the two cocycle, then you have your knot, start with your knot, start, find the quantal that's colored, we call it X. <coughs> Sorry. Pick your abelian group A. <coughs> Sorry. For each. <coughs> Then you have your knot diagram, you fix the coloring of the knot diagram, and then you take the Boltzmann weight. C of x, y, if it's positive crossing, it's just plus, if it's negative crossing, it's minus one. Then for given coloring, you multiply all those elements in the group. I'm using a multiplicative notation. And then you add, you sum over all possible coloring, and this, the output belongs in the ring Z of A. And uh, they proved that this is not invariant. Okay, I'll show you a few computations, but before that, let me make the comments that if, if I go back to the, yeah, if this product comes out to be one, then you will be adding sigma over C of one, then you get exactly the number of coloring. Then if this product of the weight for fixed coloring end up to be one, you end up with the number of coloring. This tells you that this is generalization of the number of coloring. Uh, let me explain a little bit why it is an enhancement. It's an enhancement in the sense that, imagine I have two knots, K and K prime. I color them by some quantal X. 
Again, we are interested in non-trivial coloring. Okay, any quandle can color not trivially. That's boring, it's not interesting. And imagine I compute the number of coloring of K, I end up with nine. And the number of coloring of K prime, I end up with nine. Now, with only the number of coloring, I cannot tell them apart. But if I do an enhance the quantile co-cycle invariant, now here I write phi, uh, phi of k equals 6 plus 3u. Pick say my, my a is the, the, the group z2 generated by u such that u squared equal 1. Then the, the, uh, the quantile co-cycle invariant will have the shape of a plus bu. If for k I have 6 plus 3u and for k prime I have 3 plus 6u, then I am able to distinguish them. Uh, keep in mind that here the total number of coloring is 6. Uh, I'm sorry, is 9, 6 and 3. 6 plus 3 is 9, 3 plus 6 is 9. But this partition allows you to, uh, to distinguish them. Uh, here are some computations again for some small knots and using some nice uh, easy quandles. <coughs> take the torus link T42, basically take two strings and braid them, put four crossing in them. Uh, the operation is just 2y minus x. I take A to be the group of integers generated by T. Here is an explicit co-cycle. And then I compute the quantile co-cycle invariant for this. It ends up to be 8 plus 80. The total number of coloring is uh, 16. And one can check by just, if you do the diagram and you put variables on the top A, B, you propagate them all the way down. One notice that two things. If uh, the pair A, B, if A plus B is odd, the contribution is T. If it's uh, even, the contribution is, uh, is one and you end up with this invariant. Okay. Uh, I want to mention a little bit, uh, I have about six minutes, correct? Yes, six minutes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I will talk about generalization of the quantum homology. This was done by uh, Andres Kuvich and Grania. Even though just before this, uh, Carter Seto and myself did, did what's called the twisted quantum homology, but I'm going to skip it because of time. It's just a special case of this. Later, uh, Andres Kuvich and Grania, and Grania made some generalization. I start with the quantum. I'm going to talk about the quantum module, okay, because I want to do homology theory. An abelian group with collection of automorphisms, eta xy, and uh, endomorphism tau xy. There are some axioms, obviously. One can see the axioms either from, from the, from the Raidmeister moves, or for algebraic, they can just see it with this. This is like extension. What we do extension of group, we can do extension of quandals. Then I have a quandal x, okay, xy are in, in x, a, b are in my abelian group. And on the pair x, a, comma, y, b, I define this operation by this relation here. Now, if you do the right distributivity, you'll end up with these axioms being satisfied. An example is, I can start with an abelian group, f being automorphism of the group a, and I define x star y to be f of x plus identity minus f of y. Okay, this is also so-called the generalized Alexander quandle. Then A becomes a quantile module by this. So eta xy will be the map F, and tau xy will be identity minus F. Remember that this, these two maps have to add up to one. That comes from Raidmeister move one. Uh, in order to define the cohomology or the homology theory, uh, there are a few technicalities. I have to define this element, basically x1, xn. It's just you do the operation, and you put parentheses this way. Then now I can state the boundary uh, uh, map. Uh, and it's somehow similar to the previous one, except it gets a certain term here. Then the simplest example, if eta is identity, this will disappear, and tau is zero, you get exactly the one we had before. To make it simpler, I'm going to show you a few elementary computation. And this is Grania operator on two elements is given by this formula. Now, if I'm doing cohomology, that will be a quantum homomorphism. It can be f of x star y equal eta x y of f x plus star x y of y. Uh, the boundary evaluated are three elements. 
Again, if tau is zero, this disappears. And, the, and if this is identity, you get x minus x star y, which is exactly uh, Carter, Canada say to uh, boundary. Same thing here. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I should start talking about topological quandals. Uh, or I should stop and discuss them tomorrow in addition to the quantum rings. Uh, I can either do a little bit of this or it will make maybe sense to just uh, stop here, maybe three minutes earlier. Should I stop here or I continue a little bit? You may, if you like, you may continue a little bit. Okay. Then let's, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about topological quantities. Now, earlier I was discussing just uh, set theoretical quantities, then sets, and the, the maps were just, uh, you know, either isomorphism or just uh, bijections. If you want to talk about topological quantities, you start with topological space, and you have a binary operation, and you require this. You require that, I'm oh, sorry, that the binary operation has to be continuous because you are in the category of topological spaces. And the right multiplication, previously it was bijection, now I have to require it being homeomorphism. And the right distributivity is here then. This is the definition of topological quandal, basically quandal in the category of topology. Here are some uh, simple examples. Take the real line, pick a non-zero element, and this is basically the Alexander quandal because I want it to be invertible, so I have a quantum, I have to be able to uh, have right multiplication being invertible, I should be able to solve for x, then t has to be non-zero. Uh, the example we saw earlier work also for, for uh, topological groups, and you see they are exactly the same. This is conjugation, except now I have topological group. It can be like the circle S1, it can be the, the quaternions of norm 1, S3, or SU2 if you like, uh, then this is the conjugation quantal on topological group. One can check that all those three axioms are satisfied. Uh, this is the core quantal, okay, on topological group. And uh, there is an example coming from uh, symmetric spaces. If you have Riemannian manifold with an isometry, you can define uh, the isometry has a point is fixed. X triangle X will be X then you can define x triangle y by this formula. Uh, the simplest example is the spheres. Take the n sphere and define the binary operation as two times two x. This is the dot product, okay? Two x dot y, y minus x, and one can check that this, is, uh, this gives a, a quandle, topological quandle on the n sphere. Uh, obviously, one can pass this to the projective space. You just have to check. First of all, one notices that if you stick lambda in x and mu in y, uh, quickly you can check this relation. Now, remember, I need to do the projective span. I have to identify uh, uh, antipodal points in the sphere, x and minus x. Then one can check that this gives a topological quantum structure on, on the projective space. These are some examples. Now, as you expect, one can talk about uh, homomor quantal homomorphism. Then quantal homomorphism in this context will be a continuous map. Uh, continuous map, f of x triangle y is f of x triangle f y. And uh, if I want to say isomorphism, f has, has to be uh, homeomorphism. Then again, one can think about the classification of topological quantiles as we did earlier with uh, classification of quantiles. Things get obviously more complicated. Uh, here are two examples. Maybe I can stop with this since my time is almost over. Uh, take three element sets with this quantile operation. This is one of the, the quantiles of order three. This is quantile is not. Uh, uh, Connected, it has two orbits, the orbit 3, 2, and the orbit 1. Uh, take these two topologies on them, tau 1 being the empty singleton 1 and the set x, tau 2 being the empty singleton 1, 2, pair 1, 2, and this is obviously topologies. 
and clearly here again I'm, uh, these two uh, topological quantum are not isomorphics because clearly they're not even homeomorphic as topological space and they cannot be isomorphic as topological quantum uh, I think I'm going to stop here if you have any question and tomorrow I can continue on this and talk about uh, the quantum rings Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Damdadi. So uh, for this nice talk. So are there any questions from students or others? Okay, so there is a question uh, for you, Professor Damdadi. Yes. So the question is from Kasturi. She's asking quandals uh, seems more of algebraic uh, objects, of course, motivated by North theory. So what are the other uh, uh, places in mathematics and for uh, maybe in natural sciences where quandals may appear and uh, might be it might be fruitful to carry that direction okay nice question uh, first of all uh, there are people who work on the theory of quasi groups if you just google quasi groups you know move on groups uh, you can study this basically a quasi group it's a binary set with binary equation in which you allow both right multiplication and left multiplication to be invertible. They are Latin. Uh, also recently, uh, luckily recently, I wrote a paper on a protein folding with Colin Adams, uh, Ali Reza Mashagi and uh, students in which we use quandle to study uh, uh, protein foldings. Now, to be honest with you, I had to learn a little bit of biology. I still don't know much, but I learned just the basics. And uh, for me, I just, uh, as mathematician, I turn everything into mathematics. Out of those experiments they do, I come, we turn them into some diagrams following the rules. Uh, there are bonds in the, in the, in, in the proteins. And uh, again, I wrote a couple papers on singular knot theory and quandles. One with Sam Nelson and one with my postdoc and students. And we use that to uh, investigate uh, uh, to use quandals to distinguish some uh, proteins. That's a recent paper which published, was published recently in the Journal of Chemistry, Mathematical Chemistry. My feeling is quandals have, uh, have, uh, have application in many areas. Also, if you look at the paper of, uh, of Brieskorn, there are really some nice ideas there uh, in connection to the study with singularity. I'm sure they do appear in algebraic geometry. I think I've seen one or two papers in some algebraic geometry with quandals, but I cannot say much about that. They can also be studied purely algebraically, ignore not theory, and there are a lot of people, if you look recently, there have been so many investigation of quandals are just purely algebraic structures. Thank you, any more questions? So one more question uh, from Nilang Shu. So can someone talk about the rank of these cohomologies here? Whether or not the alternating sum of the ranks gives some well-known not invariant. So maybe his question is about whether the Euler characteristic of quantum cohomology gives something, uh, class, some classical invariant. Okay. Uh, I will just basically give a hint. There is a nice paper by uh, Rubinstein about topological quandals in which he constructs the coloring of quandals. Now, the coloring of quandals this time become topological space. Okay? The, the paper is on the archive. Very nice paper. I don't remember. It's 2007 or something like that. Rubinstein. Yeah, I think it's just titled just... Topological Quandals. Also. Topological Quandals. It's a really nice paper, nice, nice foundation. And in fact, he computes the, the space of coloring of the knot. He starts with some nice knots, you know, the threefold, the figure eight knot. And in fact, it was discovered that it relates, there is some parallel with the Kovanov homology. Now, Kovanov homology, I'm assuming Luke Hoffman will talk about it later today. And maybe uh, Yosef and other people may talk about uh, Kovanov homology, which is categorification of the Jones polynomial. And in the paper of Rubinstein, he, he discussed a little bit, uh, yeah, this question. 
Now, uh, there were some papers, again, in early computation of homology, uh, quantum homology, I think uh, Sam Nelson with his advisor, Letherland, had some results about the ranks of those groups. Uh, Carter Saito, Kamada, and students had some in other papers. Those were just for, for finite quantum. Rubinstein's they deal with topological quandals. I think there are a lot of interesting, interesting questions to do, basically, yes, about quandal dependent. Take Lee quandal or smooth quandal, get in the category of manifolds, you know, and try to do, I mean, one yeah. can ask a lot of questions and I think they are interesting objects. Yeah, in more geometric questions could be asked in that category. So are there any co more questions from students? All right, so one more question from Sayyid Amdadi. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question is from Manpreet. Quantal two co-cycles can be used to uh, so sort of generalize the classical quantal coloring, uh, not coloring, right? Correct, yes. So his question is, uh, uh, quantal three co-cycles, can they be used? Uh, uh, which invariant do quantal three co-cycles generalize? Can, can you use three co-cycles to uh, retrieve some classical invariants? Sure. Maybe I forgot to mention that two co-cycles are used to, the, to study not in the three space. Three co-cycles are used to study knotted surfaces in the four space. Yeah. There is a lot of work about this by uh, uh, Carter Saito, Kamada, uh, Shin Sato, in which you can talk about uh, uh, spun of the knots. Basically, the three co-cycle can be used to, to study. In fact, there is quantal co-cycle invariant for knotted surfaces. It's the same formula I had, except I have to have three co-cycle in it. Then I sum over possible other uh, colors and the products of the, the Boltzmann weight using the three co-cycle, and that's an invariant of knotted surfaces. Shin Sato has some beautiful results here. Uh, one can, can check, yes. Thank you. So Professor Saichi Kamada has a nice comment that three co-cycles can be used for classical knots too by shadow coloring. So maybe he will... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, I, Professor Kamada. Yes. So, any more questions from students? So, Manpreet has one more question. So, can we say something more about homology of prime knots, uh, quantal homology of prime knots? I mean, uh, uh, do they have some? Uh, is is prime? I think his question is: Is primeness of knots captured in the quantal homology? If I understand it correctly. Uh, we are talking about homology of quandals. Okay, what prime, I mean, what do you... So, I mean, if a knot is, if you take a prime knot... Yeah, prime knots, yes. And take the knot quandal. Uh-huh. And now, uh, so compute is homology. So uh, which homology... Okay. Uh, which homology? Hold on. Quandal, uh, homolo quandal homology of the knot quandal. I think that's the question. Ah, okay. Uh, yes, yes, the knot quantal relate to the fundamental group, okay. Uh, yes, 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 and I'm sorry, what is the question? Can we... Uh, yeah, so we... I, will, I will read the question out. So can we say something about homology of prime, uh, quantal homology of prime knots? I think he means the homology of the knot quantal. Correct, correct, yes. I mean, uh, I, I don't think in general, but maybe for some subclasses, maybe some torus knots and things like that. I, I, in general, I think it's not known, at least for me. But maybe for some subclasses, yes, one can, can, can say something. But in general, I think for just uh, prime, prime knots, I don't think there is certain property coming from the homology of the their fundamental quantum. Maybe for some subclasses, yes, that's possible. 
So Hitesh uh, has a question. Uh, so what can we say about generators in the fundamental quantum of a knot? Uh, knot? Uh, I mean, can uh, two generators be equal? Yeah, so yes. Professor Kamada has already answered, so answer is no. I mean, we, we're coloring the arcs, except, yeah, there are different because you have the, you're coloring different arcs. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions from students? So if there are no more questions, so let us thank Professor Ilam Dadi for this wonderful introduction to Quandals. Thank you, Professor Ilam Dadi. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.